Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage, Mr. Larkin Rose. I'm not even going to use a microphone because I'm loud. <laughs> and if you couldn't hear that, move to the front of the room. Once upon a time, there were some mean, tyrannical, meany, horrible, bad people, and they oppressed a bunch of good, noble, virtuous people. The end. <laughs> Often we view reality in an oversimplified, almost comic book type way where we, we think in general terms and in, in general concepts that sort of muddle over the reality and the, the, you know, the more nuanced details of what's going on. I'm going to use the example of when Germany in World War II invaded France. I realize Germany is a place and France is a place, and as anarchists we realize Germany didn't do anything, a bunch of people who believed in authority Obeyed, but I'm still going to call it Germany invading France, knowing that we understand what that actually means. So Germany invades France, and the way we usually think of it is there's a bunch of mean, scary German aggressors, and they go in, and there's a bunch of noble, innocent, good French people who were the victims of it. That is not the reality of the situation. When the German army invaded, very quickly, a bunch of political opportunist buttheads that happened to be French realized, you know, we might be able to hang on to some of our power if we kiss the butt of the new tyrant who's in charge. And so German army came in and they said, hey, which of you want to be shot and or exiled and or whatever, and which of you want to now kiss our butts and do as, as you're told? And so you got the Vichy government of France, which was a bunch of French people being collaborators for their oppressors, helping the Nazis to oppress the people of France. And it wasn't just the politicians. It was a bunch of their law enforcers and their bureaucrats and their tax collectors and the whole, the whole control mechanism that was already there in France because it already had a government. And the parts of it, the, the people in it that said, I'm not going to play this game. I'm not going to act as a collaborator for this invading army. Well, you don't get to play. Get out. And then the ones, like most politicians do, the ones who cared more about themselves than any principle or freedom or anything like that said, yeah, we'll kiss your butt and do what you say as long as we can still have a little bit of power. So imagine that you're somebody living in, in France and you decide to be part of the French resistance. Like, I'm not too fond of the, the German army and the Nazis coming over and saying they get to rule my country. Your enemy is not just the Germans. It's not just the German army. Now it's the German army and our own freaking French politicians that decided to kiss their ass and collaborate with them to oppress us. And the people who decided there, the French people who decided to stay there as enforcers and bureaucrats and paper pushers and tax collectors. And as if that wasn't bad enough, there you are, the, the guy in France trying to resist this, there's another layer of collaborators, which is all of your law-abiding neighbors who are still going along with authoritarian control, despite the fact that it changed from, well, now we, yesterday we had French tyrants bossing us around taking our money, and now we have German tyrants bossing us around taking our money, but whatever, you have to obey the law. You have to do as you're told. So a lot of your neighbors, there you are as the, the French guy, not too happy with being taken over by the Nazis, a lot of your neighbors are also collaborators with your oppressors. So it's not at all as simple as these were the bad guys who came in and oppressed us, and these are the good guys resisting. No, lots of your neighbors, and half the politicians and half the law enforcers, become the enemy, become collaborators with the enemy. And... To bring that to the U.S. and to modern times, it is very easy for us and, and somewhat justified to imagine that our enemy is the politicians who want to boss us around. Because, yeah, there's a bunch of sociopathic, power-happy, warmongering psychos. They are definitely part of the enemy. They are not the entire enemy. Below them is this vast collection of enforcers. Again, tax collectors and cops and bureaucrats and all level of, of leeches of the state. 
And keep in mind, that comes from us. That is us. That is some of us deciding to be collaborators with the people who rob and oppress us. So that, and um, you know, everybody here is aware of that, most of, you know, most of your neighbors are in on the game. They, are, they believe in it. They reinforce it. Some of them will even squeal on you if you like, try to have a lemonade stand without a permit. <laughs> so everything from the actual malicious politicians to the stupid cops who just say, I'm just doing my job, and it may be your neighbor, it may be your relative doing the job of oppressing you on behalf of these psychos in, in D.C. or state capital or wherever it is, all the way down to the neighbors who will squeal on you. So you realize it isn't just there's some bad people over there. It's there's a small number of bad people and a huge number of intellectual and moral cowards who are collaborators with the bad people. And often it's just from weakness and, and cowardice. Well, I just go along, I just do as I'm told, I'm a law-abiding taxpayer. But they are still collaborators. They are still part of the enemy and part of the threat to your freedom. And part of the threat to their own freedom, but they seem too dense to notice that half the time. So, this is nothing new. And here is a quote that is about half a millennium old from uh, Etienne de Bauti, I think I pronounced that almost right. All this havoc, this misfortune, this ruin descends upon you not from alien foes, but from the one enemy whom you yourselves render as powerful as he is, for whom you go bravely to war, for whose greatness you do not refuse to offer your own bodies unto death. He who thus domineers over you has only two eyes, only two hands, only one body, no more than is possessed by the least man among the infinite numbers dwelling in your cities. He has indeed nothing more than the power that you confer upon him to destroy you. Where has he acquired enough eyes to spy upon you if you do not provide them yourselves? How can he have so many arms to beat you with if he does not borrow them from you? The feet that trample down your cities, where does he get them if they are not your own? How does he have any power over you except through you? How would he dare assail you if he had no cooperation from you? What could he do to you if you yourselves did not connive with the thief who plunders you, if you were not accomplices of the murderer who kills you, if you were not traitors to yourselves? That is the reality of the situation. The tiny number of genuine sociopaths trying to control the world yeah, they're bad. They are not the primary problem. The primary problem is all the people who not only imagine that to be legitimate and legal and lawful and we have to obey that, but actually help it, whether it's by like becoming an actual enforcer or just squealing on people or even just the societal pressure of shunning and condemning anyone who like doesn't pay their fair share or doesn't obey the law or you possess the wrong plant, you naughty, naughty person. Anyone who has the mentality that pushes the idea that we are obligated to bow to these people, they are collaborators. Even if not physically, they are psychologically, and as far as propaganda goes, they are collaborators with their own oppression and everybody else's. But today, I want to talk about a collaborator even below that. So we have the tyrants and their enforcers and your neighbors and that. One of the worst tyrants one of the worst collaborators of the tyrants is your own brain. And I can speak from experience that when I got to the point of intellectually understanding that authority is bogus, that nobody can have the right to rule, that you know all the different reasons why government cannot be legitimate. Like if you take away all the things that make it illegitimate and violent and immoral, it's not government anymore, it's just people organizing and cooperating. Even after I came to that conclusion and realized that, I could still feel inside me the training, the, the deeply implanted indoctrination. And it's basically, it's like the Pavlov study of training dogs. If there's a dog in the rolled up magazine, he gets smacked on the nose every time he poops on the rug. And dogs being the approval loving wusses they are, they go, uh, oh, like, I know that was bad. I wasn't supposed to do that because you keep smacking me. Whereas cats are just anarchists. And it's like, you can smack me. I don't give a crap. 
But these wussy status dogs, they learn that's bad. And after a while, you don't have to hit them anymore because they know it was bad for me to poop on the rug because they have it deeply ingrained in them. Well, most of us, including me for a long time, have ingrained in us the feeling, the profound assumption that disobedience equals bad. And that is trained into us from before we can even talk um, by most of our parents and by teachers and by society in general and obviously by government and by the media. It's constantly bashed into us. And the depth of that feeling that has nothing to do with intellectual understanding, but the depth of that feeling that it is bad to disobey authority takes a while to overcome. And I don't particularly like admitting that even when, when I was intellectually an anarchist, I could still feel that. Like there's a guy with a uniform and a badge, and part of me is like, do as he says. My brain is like, shut up. <laughs> but why are you still in there? Because the psychological level is so deep that we, you can't just talk yourselves out of it. Um, and one thing I would compare it to is like a, uh, I actually just thought of this yesterday at Candles in the Dark. Um, a kid who's like scared of monsters under his bed. And the parent comes in and says, all right, let's, let's do this scientifically and rationally. We're going to turn on all the lights. We're going to investigate every corner. Is there, uh, first of all, is there any monster there? No. Is there anywhere he could be hiding? We're going to look in every crevice. Is there any like way up through the floorboards? No, there's nothing there. And then you turn off the lights and you lie in bed and he's like, I'm pretty sure there are monsters under my bed. <laughs> because the fear doesn't come from, from logic and evidence. It comes from that gut level existential psychological fear and that is where authoritarianism sticks in its roots and hangs on and to get it out of there takes a lot more time and effort than just to understand oh yeah nobody has the right to rule me blah 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 you know the very simple explanations for why authoritarianism is bogus and if you want to know how powerful that type of indoctrination can be one of the best examples I can point to is slavery and I remember, I think I was still even a statist when this occurred to me. I was like, how does slavery work? You got one fat white guy on a plantation and you have 50 strong black slaves. How the hell does he keep them in line? Why don't they like kill him or beat him up or run away or something? They're, they're way stronger than he is. You know, he might have a gun, but you know, he's going to sleep sometime. It didn't occur to me until much later, and then I had a more thorough understanding after I read the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, who was a slave. Most of them thought they were supposed to be slaves. And that's really hard for people today to, to understand and believe. What do you mean they thought they were supposed to be slaves? And Frederick Douglass talked about his own journey of realizing, I don't think this is okay. And to me, and the guy was brilliant, like his writings are just brilliant, to me, physically escaping slavery was way less impressive than reading about his mental escape from slavery where he noticed the indoctrination and he undid it in himself and then he tried to undo it in others and he would argue with them and they would, a lot of the slaves would literally believe that to run away is immoral and constitutes stealing because you're stealing yourself from the guy who rightfully owns you that is how powerful this indoctrination can be. Let me use Frederick Douglass' own words. To make a contented slave, you must make a thoughtless one. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision, and as far as possible, to annihilate his power of reason. He must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. That's the part of the quote you usually hear. I'm going to add what comes next. The man that takes his earnings must be able to convince him that he has a perfect right to do so. It must not depend upon mere force. The slave must know no higher law than his master's will. The whole relationship must not only demonstrate to his mind its necessity, but its absolute rightfulness. Now we can look back and say, that was horrible. How did they ever believe it? Oop, it's tax time. And you're bad if you don't pay. Because, hey, the man that takes your earnings has a perfect right to do so, doesn't he? Because it's law and taxation, and we voted, and there's all this mythology and constitutions and stuff. Ta-da, they have the right to take our money. The indoctrination is still there. 
Um, now, it was too long to include here, but there's actually, there's a part in his autobiography where Frederick Douglass, basically, he was upgraded to being kind of a slave, but with an income tax, where his master said, you can go out and earn money on your own. I get most of it, but you can keep some. And at first, he was all thrilled, and later he figured out, this is even worse, because it gives the illusion that I'm sort of free, but you get to decide how much of it to steal after the fact. That's called an income tax. A slave said that an income tax is worse than slavery. <laughs> Most people don't know that. But it has to do with the mental indoctrination of realizing, why do I think I'm beholden to these people? Why do I think I have an obligation? to? Why is my own brain being a collaborator with my oppressors? And that is the result of indoctrination, being trained to feel at the deepest level that authority is real, that they have the right to rule and that you have an obligation to obey. And so if a cop pulls you over, there's two kinds of compliance. The first kind, I've said this before, I view cops the same way I view rabid dogs. Stupid animal, something's horribly wrong with its brain, it's dangerous, so maybe don't make any sudden movements or loud noises because it might hurt you. But it's not because the rabid dog has a right to bite you. It's just self-preservation. So the one kind of compliance is, I don't want to get bit by this rabid dog. The other kind of compliance is feeling shame and guilt at having disobeyed some random arbitrary victimless law. Oh, I'm so sorry I didn't have the right weird sticker on my other weird piece of metal that you told me to have on my car. I feel so ashamed. Can you... Can you please show mercy? That is collaboration with, that is your mind being a collaborator with your own oppressor to feel bad about that. And we were all trained to feel bad about that. We were trained to feel the guilt and the shame of disobedience to authority. Now, I'm happy to say <clears throat> that this trend is to some extent going backwards. I mean, exhibit A, hi guys. <laughs> But there have also been polls um, asking the American people, if you could cheat on your taxes, as if there's such thing as cheating a robber and having it counting as cheating. <laughs> if you could cheat on your taxes and get away with it, would it be moral to do so? Are you morally okay with that? The number of people who say yes has been going up, which means the number of people who are escaping that indoctrination. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> The number of people whose minds are no longer acting as collaborators with their oppressors is going up. And we just need it to get to 100%. Because imagine, and, and it's, it's so easy to view the enemy as big and powerful in this. Imagine if that gets to 100% of just, we'll use just the U.S. for now, of American taxpayers. If 100 and some million people say... We don't have an obligation to give you any money. Now, if we think you might steal our stuff or put us in a cage, we might do it anyway out of self-preservation. Then you have, so you have, you know, a couple hundred thousand, a couple hundred million, sorry, people who the IRS wants to rob and who feel no obligation to comply. Meanwhile, you have less than 100,000 IRS paper pushers, only like 2,000 of which are armed. The rest just push paper around. How do you think they could rob 100 million people if those 100 million people didn't feel an obligation to obey and pay? They couldn't. The victims of authoritarian control always outnumber the victimizers, and they have to economically. Like, if you have 15 thugs robbing one guy, it doesn't work. He doesn't produce enough to fund the 15 thugs. They have to rob a huge number. And if that huge number stops imagining an obligation to go along with the robbery, they're in deep doo-doo. When you speak and act out in the, the real world as if you have an obligation to obey, and you talk that way in front of other people because you don't want to sound weird and kooky, you are reinforcing their indoctrination. You are basically helping them to be collaborators against themselves and against you. Whereas if you have the courage to go out there and just openly and confidently say, yeah, all taxation is bogus. Taxation is theft. 
all the government laws that are, are the initiation of violence, they're all illegitimate and you have zero obligation to obey them. Don't feel guilty if you want to smoke pot or hide it. You might want to be careful depending on where you are and you know, how hard you have to hide it. Again, out of self-preservation because there are rabid dogs who would bite you if they knew you were doing that. But don't feel guilt about disobeying these random arbitrary decrees of a bunch of crooks. Don't believe in the divine right of politicians. You own yourself. And the thing is, the more we act that way and talk that way confidently, the more other people hear it, and at least they have the opportunity to question it and think about it. Because if they never hear it anywhere, they're the slave on the plantation who thinks this is how it is, this is how it should be. We need to be the Frederick Douglass going, you know, just occurred to me, this isn't how it should be. This is screwed up. And they might fight back and they might complain, but if they don't hear it from you, they may not hear it from anybody, and you are allowing them to be collaborators against themselves. You have to push human consciousness in the right direction, and you cannot and you will not do that as long as you feel any shame or guilt or hesitation when it comes to owning yourself. You have to all the way know that you are beholden to no one to no legislation, to no governing body, to no authority above your own conscience. That is where the real battle happens. You know, people talk about, we have to have a revolution, blah, 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 and whatever. The revolution that matters is people figuring out those people are not the boss of us and escaping the indoctrination so that we're not collaborators with the enemy against ourselves. Um, to quote Stephen Biko, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And that is absolutely true. There are tanks and bombs and all that. Uh, people talk about, what about all these big machines they have? People man those machines until people don't man those machines. And when a tank doesn't have a tank driver in it, it's not really a threat to us anymore. Because remember, our oppressors come from us. Like, Etienne was talking about. We're the ones who, we as a whole, are the ones who volunteer to oppress ourselves on behalf of the lying crooks in DC or state capitals. When that ends, when we don't let them have control of our brains, then they don't have control of our bodies. And people talk about like, you know, we need guns to be able to defend ourselves. Excellent. We need to use cryptos to be able to build alternative, uh, alternative markets and ways of trading that the the parasites can't spy on and, and rob us, and we need bartering and a, a black market and ways to trade around them. All of those are awesome, and none of them do any good if people don't first give up the notion that we have an obligation to bow. Because if you still believe you have an obligation to bow, then you're like, come take it. And they say, that's illegal. And you say, okay, you can have it. <laughs> And unfortunately, that's a lot of conservative America. And it's the same thing with cryptos and black markets or anything else. If they say, ah, oh, tisk tisk, you're not allowed to do that. Okay, I'm so sorry. Instead of, oh, I certainly won't do that anymore. <laughs> Sneak and hide, but if you don't feel guilt at disobeying the control freaks and you spread that, that, that attitude and that viewpoint to other people, they lose all their power because, like the quote said, the only power they have is the power we give them by pretending they have the right to do that. So here is the last part of that Etienne thing, uh, Discourse on Voluntary Servitude is the title of the whole thing, the whole, the, the whole article. This is the end of it. Resolve to serve no more and you are at once freed. I do not ask that you place hands upon the tyrant to topple him over, but simply that you support him no longer. Then you will behold him like a great colossus whose pedestal has been pulled away, fall of his own weight, and break in pieces. Of course, out of self-preservation, at the moment, you may still have to cooperate with certain types of uh, and certain levels of injustice and stuff here and there to not get shot or throat, thrown in a cage. Um, the same way you might cooperate with an armed thug or you know, be careful around a rabid dog, 
But don't act and don't think as if the thug or the rabid dog has some moral right to do what it does and that you have some moral obligation to go along with it and cooperate. In other words, don't let your own mind be a collaborator of your oppressor. Without shame, without any shame, without any guilt, without any hesitation, always think like you own yourself and talk like you own yourself and act like you own yourself because you do. Thank you. <laughs>